you ever heard of Kringle before? <laughs> Have you ever heard of Kringle before? Have you ever heard of Kringle before? You very good boy. And you? Have you ever heard of a Kringle? Have you ever heard of Kringle before? You mean like Chris Kringle? No, I do not. <laughs> no, I haven't. Excellent. <laughs> yes. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone here know what Kringle is? Nope. Hello and welcome to this episode of Bake It Up a Notch. I'm Erin Jean McDowell. And I am so excited for today's episode because we are truly talking about a pastry that I love deep to my core and that not enough people know about. I cannot wait to shout it high from the rooftops. We are talking about Kringle. The first thing you need to know is that you can think of Kringle as a giant sliceable Danish. But the other thing you need to know is that I have a very personal connection with this pastry. I grew up loving to snag a Kringle whenever we were on a road trip, when we were in Illinois. They sometimes had them at truck stops even in Wisconsin. They were at every grocery store. So it's something that I just love, love, love to get. But I was really surprised to discover when I took a poll on my own social media that about 75% of the people who responded to my poll did not know what Kringle is. So not only am I excited to tell you all about it, I'm so excited to give you three delicious recipes so you can learn to make Kringle at home. We're gonna talk a little bit about its fascinating history all throughout this episode, but really what you need to know is it is a delicious, yeast-risen, buttery pastry crust with some kind of tasty filling and some kind of really delicious sweet topping. While it's still a little bit of a project, I've tried to streamline this recipe as much as possible to make this really, really a fun baking project for the whole family. Lots of people can get involved. And best of all, this pastry keeps really well. We'll talk more about that later, but it's such a great pastry to make and then slowly slice and nibble on for several days. It's also a great thing to gift. We're gonna talk about all the things I love about it, and I really can't wait to get started, so let's get baking. The dough for Kringle is actually pretty easy to make, and I make mine in the food processor. But remember, there's kind of two parts to making this dough. There's the first part where we're just gonna make the dough, that's the easy part, and then later we're gonna manipulate it and add lamination to help give it flaky layers and make it into a true Danish dough. So we'll start with some all-purpose flour, and to that I'm gonna add a little bit of sugar and then just a little bit of butter right now. We'll add the rest later when we laminate, perfect. So I'm gonna give this a pulse together to combine until the butter is almost invisible. It's been completely incorporated. It's so great to use the food processor to make this because it does quick work of it and we're gonna spend a lot of time manipulating this later so it's sort of like where are the places we can take a shortcut and this is one of them. So now that I've incorporated the butter, you can kind of see this texture pretty much just looks like flour, but maybe it's gotten a little yellow in color, and also all the sugar is incorporated, distributed throughout. So that's what we're looking for. Next, we're going to add our yeast and some salt. So the yeast goes in, this is instant yeast, and also our salt. Let's give that a pulse to combine just to make sure everything is incorporated evenly. Perfect, okay. Our final ingredients are some egg yolks only. So I'm gonna separate these eggs and we need two egg yolks. And then finally, we need to add a little bit of whole milk to this. It's, it's not a lot of milk and I did already start to warm it up on the stove. We really just want it to kind of feel warm to the touch. Okay, now let's pulse this. The idea is to bring it together into a smooth, uniform dough. Whenever you're mixing any kind of yeasted dough, it goes through a stage known as the pickup stage. This is a little bit easier to see when you're mixing in an electric stand mixer, but in the food processor, what it sort of looks like is at first you're gonna see things kind of wash up on the edges of the side, but eventually the dough will pick up all of those pieces and kind of form one uniform dough. So basically what we're looking for is for the dough to be evenly hydrated. It might even look a little bit powdery when you first look at it, but when you press it, it's going to hold together. And as you can see, the dough can be like looking a little bit powdery or still not totally combined. So I'm just gonna give it a few kneads right here on my work surface. Then I'm gonna try to shape it into a little bit of a square so that it's already starting to be in the shape that I need when we go to laminate it later. 
Then we'll wrap it in some plastic wrap and it needs to refrigerate for two hours or up to 24 hours. So this is a great thing you can do ahead and you can just do a little bit of the Kringle process and then get to the next part tomorrow if you want. I've eaten so much Kringle in my life, but I really didn't know a ton about the history and so I got super nerdy in researching this episode. The dough, the pastry itself, has its origins in Europe and kind of France specifically is where laminated doughs were created and supposedly it was created by accident in the 1600s. Um, a baker's apprentice forgot to put the butter into a pastry dough that they were making, sort of didn't realize it till later, tried to add it to the dough after it had already been mixed and baked it anyway. And when the baker, head baker came back, was so surprised to discover how light, tender, and flaky the dough was that they started to actually do this on purpose and create this technique. And it spread like wildfire, mostly to Italy and Austria where they really began to run with these techniques. It doesn't need to be a perfect square. We just want it to be roughly square for what we're gonna end up doing. We can kind of get more precise after the dough has chilled for a while. Now remember, this chill time is to help relax the dough. It's to help firm up some of that fat that's in there and to help it kind of distribute some of its hydration just so it's gonna be easier for us to roll out later. So at least two hours. And like I said, you can do this up to a day ahead if you want. Into the fridge it goes. Okay, this is some dough that I chilled. I mentioned it can be for up to 24 hours, so full disclosure, friends, flake friends, I just made this yesterday, and we uh, let it rest overnight. So now I'm going to roll it out. And we're gonna do a very simplified form of lamination, and for a few different reasons. I really want this Kringle recipe to be something that you try. It's still a little bit of a project, and I know the process of lamination can be kind of scary, but I simplified it as much as I could by enlisting a hack that some of you are probably already familiar with. So we're gonna start by rolling it out to about eight by 15 inches, and it's gonna be about a quarter of an inch thick. So after the process and techniques of lamination spread throughout Europe, now we're gonna fast forward to the 1850s when there is a historic baker's strike in Denmark. And at that time in Denmark, and I think actually in a lot of European countries, it was customary to pay certain food laborers like bakers only with room and board instead of actually paying them in any kind of cash monies. So they were all striking because they wanted money instead of room and board. And as a result, there were uh, a lot of out of work Danish bakers. And the bakery owners started bringing in bakers from surrounding or other European countries just because they needed to operate these bakeries. And so also what's happening right at this same time is in the 1800s, mid 1800s, a lot of Europeans and, and all people from around the world are immigrating to the United States. So because there's this baker strike and there's all this natural immigration happening, it just so happens that a lot of the people from Denmark immigrating to the US have skills as bakers because they were out of work and they're looking for new jobs. One of the Danish specific settlements in the United States was in rural Wisconsin. And this is why Wisconsin became such a home for Danish sort of baked goods, but specifically Kringle, because so many Danish bakers not only flooded the United States, but specifically these fairly dense areas of Wisconsin. And the tradition has continued to get passed down. And several of the most famous bakeries that make Kringle are fourth, fifth generation Danish family bakeries. So one way that I help to make sure it stays sort of rectangular is just by pulling it with my hands. Like if it's starting to look not, like I don't have as nice of a corner here, I really will just pull it a little bit and like use my hands to make more of a corner there. And like there I even tore the dough. I'm not so much worried about that. I just wanna get that rough rectangular shape so that there's gonna be butter all over this. Up here, it kind of looks like my home state of Kansas. <laughs> I always say 
I was born in the doodly doot, because see, there's Kansas. Can you see it? So see how there's like that little doodly doot up in the top? That's where my hometown is. So I have a little bit of a doodly doot up here, but I'm not mad at that because I still have a roughly rectangular shape. So now we need to grab our frozen butter. Could this be any cuter? Look, they put the butter in this adorable butter. And it's, it's, <laughs> it's like, I need one stick of frozen butter. Ta-da, it's frozen, the whole thing's frozen and it's keeping it cold. So what you're gonna do with this frozen butter is really just grate it. And when you grate it, see, you can just kind of do it right over the pastry and it will fall. And the idea here is that we've made the butter, it's cold, even once we grate it, it's still cold on the dough but we're basically making it into small, flat pieces, just like we kind of want it ultimately to be, and we're giving an even distribution throughout. In my recipe, I tell you to work with one of the longer sides facing you. At this point, I obviously have it facing vertically, so I am just gonna move it just for the sake of it matching my recipe as I wrote it for you. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna sort of visually divide the dough into thirds. And we don't have to be crazy precise here, but I'm gonna fold one portion over, one of the thirds over onto itself, press it down really firm, and then I'm going to fold the other over. And we've just completed our first fold. So the goal here is that we wanna have layers of dough, butter, dough, butter. So we've simplified it as much as we can. And one of the benefits of this is we can actually go ahead and do the second fold right away because this method is so quick that we can kind of use that in our favor. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to roll it out again to about eight by 15 and I'm going to perform one more of these folds. Then we'll refrigerate the dough because it's gonna need a rest before we handle it anymore. I'm gonna wrap it tightly in plastic wrap, chill it for 30 minutes, and then once it's nice and cold again, I'm gonna repeat this process one more time. I'm gonna roll out the dough to eight by 15 inches, visually divide it into thirds, fold it into three, just like we did here, then I'm going to let it chill overnight. So you're always gonna to wanna to make your Kringle dough the day before you want to make your Kringle. Let's wrap this up and get it chilling. Bakers in Wisconsin have created dozens of different flavors of Kringle and they've truly kind of stretched the limits. They can be filled with anything, but today we're gonna to be making three different flavors of Kringles. Of course, all the recipes are linked in the video description below for when you're wanting to make your own Kringle. But also, as always on Bake It Up a Notch, I really want to encourage you to riff and make your own Kringle flavors with different fillings or things that you like to use. So here in the middle, I have the almond filling. This is essentially a frangipan. Frangipan is usually finely ground almonds, some eggs, sugar, and flavoring. It's technically, because of the quantity of eggs, it's almost considered like a custard, but it bakes up very firm, sliceable, but still very moist and delicious. And almond is one of the most traditional flavors of Kringle, even going back to like the Danish origins of this recipe, almond was a very popular Kringle flavor. Then, like I said, I love fruit flavored Kringles. So we're gonna do a cherry cheese Kringle where we've got kind of a cream cheese, sugar, egg yolk filling, very classic, sort of tastes like cheesecake, but you just mix all those ingredients together, very quick and simple to make. And then I'm just gonna use some cherry jam as the fruit. So this is a great example. You could mix this up by using any jam that you wanted, your homemade jam, apricot, peach, blueberry, anything like that would be so good in this cheese. And if you love a cheese Danish like I do, you're gonna love that. And then I wanted to do a chocolate one, which I think is sort of like my homage to some of the very different kinds I've seen in Wisconsin, things like turtle flavored Kringles with caramel and chocolate and nuts and all those things. So this has a uh, bittersweet ganache sort of filling. And then I've got some chopped pecans here. I just tossed them in an egg white. Hey, there's a great thing to use your egg whites from before when you made the dough for. I tossed it with a little bit of egg white and some brown sugar, and it'll sort of bake up to be like those candied nuts that you sometimes even see on the streets here in New York. So that's really delicious. They get kind of caramelized. We'll put some of the nuts inside the Kringle and then we'll save a few to sprinkle on the top. It's going to be so good. So 
Kringle filling can really be whatever your heart desires, and you're gonna need not as much as you think you need. So you're gonna need, I would say, anywhere from about a heaping cup to a cup and a half volume-wise of filling if you decide to riff and make your own. Let's assemble our Kringle. I've got this dough that I made yesterday, so it's been chilling overnight. It's nice and cold, sweet little dough packet. It's ready to go. And because of the folds, it's already in the shape that we want it to be, a nice rectangle. Now, we're gonna roll it out to what is kind of a wacky size. Like, I've, I've got to admit it, this is a little bit ridiculous to the point that you might look at this recipe and think, did Erin make a typo? Is that what she meant? This is how long we will make the dough. You think you can roll the dough that long? I think you can, and I'm going to show you how right now. So what I would encourage you to do is focus on the length because usually the width will come naturally when you get it to that length. Traditional Danish Kringle were actually pretzel in shape. So they were filled the same way we're gonna fill these Danish, and then they were wrapped and twisted into a pretzel. But over the years, bakers in Wisconsin at various Danish bakeries started noticing that whenever the Kringle was put out for slicing, the last slices that were always taken were where the dough was overlapping, those twists of the pretzel. So bakers in Wisconsin basically said, why are we even going through that extra effort? Let's just make it an oval ring. That way, almost every slice is exactly the same, and the only place where there's a little overlap is where you put the two ends together. So I've got it a little longer than I need, actually. It's a little longer than 28, so now I need to check the width and see Without ever rolling it out width-wise, it's already at six and a half. So this is perfect because it's a little longer than 28. So if I adjust the width now, just make it a wee bit wider, that will shrink that extra length I have. Boom. Mm, that felt really good. We've got a 28 by seven inch wide piece of dough. It is roughly rectangular in shape, but we're not worried about it. We're not really worried about what these edges look like because they're gonna get folded inward, which you'll see shortly. And we're not really worried about what these ends look like because they are going to be all kind of folded up into this in the end as well. So now it's time to apply our filling. I'm gonna demonstrate the cherry cheese one first. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with the cheesecake filling. And you know, if you're using something like the frangipan, um, where we're just using one filling. You would just put it in a line right down the middle, like I'm doing here. But when you're using two fillings, you usually want to add kind of like the, the softer base filling first, and then let anything else kind of go on top, just for even distribution. Now let's put our cherry jam kind of in a line right down. I mentioned that in Wisconsin, they use cherries and cranberries a lot because those are big crops there. But it's also a great way to maybe pay homage to wherever you're from. Like maybe you live somewhere where Marion berries grow. So you want to make a Marion berry Kringle or a, you know, whatever you can dream up. Now we are going to tuck this filling in for a delicious oven nap. And what we need to do for that is we're just going to pick one side. I'm going to choose the right side. I'm going to fold the right side over. You'll notice it doesn't fully encase it. I actually have a little bit peeking through, but that's okay because we're also going to fold this side over. So what I'm going to do now, grab the other side, fold it up. And I don't know why I find this so delightful, but Kringle is a beautiful pastry when it's done, but it's also fairly rustic. And this is one of the ways that it is because so many pastries of croissants, Danish, they're trying to get this perfect precise shape and they might seal this or, or do something to seal this, but this is how Kringle is made. It's just folded like this and we leave it like that. I've got a parchment lined baking sheet and I'm gonna move my Kringle onto it and kind of try to start to make an oval shape. And it's okay if it ends up being a little round or a little wonky, you're gonna see. I'm gonna show you a few different levels of kind of Kringle finishing and you'll see that they all kind of look amazing and delicious in the end, even if you make mistakes. But I'll start forming, kind of first I guess it's, I'm making a horseshoe shape, I'm realizing. And I'll get those ends close to one another. And then what I'll do is I'll open one of the ends, just a little bit, and I'm going to put the other end inside of it. 
And this is how I will encase the end to make our final kind of shape. So, but that's what we're looking at. We're looking at kind of just a pretty, slightly oval Kringle. Once the Kringle is assembled, it needs to sit and do a little bit of rising. I mean, after all, this is a yeast raised pastry. So we're gonna let it sit aside for about 20 to 25 minutes, just until it looks a little bit puffier than when we started. So cover it with a little bit of plastic wrap or a clean kitchen towel and put it in a warm place, like maybe near your preheating oven. While this one is resting, I'm gonna fill and shape my remaining Kringle flavors. the Kringle after it's risen and gotten that little bit of puffiness, I just like to finish it with a little bit of egg wash. This helps it get a little bit of shine and makes it golden brown all over the surface, plus a little crispity crunch too. Plus, if you want to add any kind of garnish to the top of your Kringle, like I'm going to put some of those candied pecans on the top of our chocolate pecan Kringle, the egg wash will help them stick. Once you've egg washed or added any toppings to the surface of your Kringle, it's time to bake it. They're gonna bake at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for 20 to 25 minutes until they look golden brown and lightly puffed up. After baking, they're going to collapse slightly. This isn't a mistake. This is part of the Kringle process. Kringle almost always has some kind of icing or other sweet topping, maybe a drizzle of chocolate or some caramel sauce, something delicious and sweet. And most of them have sort of a delicious powdered sugar icing, which of course is so easy to make. I mentioned before that there can kind of be some mistakes that happen with Kringle, but they are so delicious and like unimportant that I truly didn't even wanna do a mistakes happen section of this episode, but I happened to get kind of all three examples, and so I've got them in front of me right now. This was our most perfect Kringle that came out. No filling oozed out at all, and it's a really nice oval shape, the chocolate pecan. Now these other two opened up a little bit, and I just wanna show why that's not really a big deal. This cherry cheese one opened up just a little bit, and as you can see, I can still lift it up. Most of the bottom is golden brown. It didn't prevent it from browning well. And um, we're still gonna get lots of filling in each slice because the filling is still evenly distributed. The one that looks the funkiest is our almond one here. And you can see in this case, some of the filling actually came out and kind of baked onto the tray. What this might mean is that we might have a slightly less even distribution of filling in some slices, but we can really fix this just by using a small paring knife to cut away the extra frangipan, and we're really not gonna know. Plus, this is a truly delicious chef snack. I'm gonna make icings for both the almond Kringle and the cherry cheese, they're gonna be the same icing. It's just gonna be some powdered sugar, a little bit of vanilla, and some heavy cream. You can adjust the consistency of this to make it a little bit runnier if you want to drizzle it. I like a nice thick icing just to get a really good coating all over the surface. Okay, let's whisk it. Here's our almond one. I kind of like to apply it towards the middle of the Kringle. In fact, I will just apply it with a spoon here. Hold on. I kind of put it in a line around the center of the Kringle. And then after I get it kind of in the center of the Kringle all around, I would just use like the back of my spoon to kind of spread it. The other thing I want to encourage you to do is if there is any part of the Kringle where you're like, hey, I don't love the way you look, like how we have a little bit of our almond filling coming out, let's just like smoosh some of the icing over there. No one needs to know. No one needs to know whether that's pastry or whether it's almond filling. All they'll know is that there's icing and that they want to eat it. So I think that one's pretty much done. Let's make another batch of icing and do the cherry cheese. Let's talk about storing the Kringle, because this is actually one of my favorite parts about it. 
Kringle keeps remarkably well. Not only does it keep well, it really retains the same texture that it has the day you bake it fresh for several days. Because while it has a crisp, doughy pastry crust, it also has that really nice moist filling. And the dough sort of absorbs some of the moisture from the filling to create an overall soft texture. And that soft texture will really keep well, even at room temperature, for several days. Whole Kringle can be loosely covered with plastic wrap or beeswax wrap or even just a clean kitchen towel once the icing is set. You just really need to loosely cover it and you can store it at room temperature in the refrigerator or in the freezer. At room temperature, the Kringle will keep well for up to four days. In the refrigerator, Kringle will keep for up to one week. And in the freezer, the Kringle will keep well for up to three months. To thaw the Kringle, you're just gonna want to leave it in the refrigerator overnight, or you can leave it at room temperature for a few hours. You can refresh a Kringle in a low oven at about 300 degrees. If you're planning to freeze your Kringle, I would recommend not icing it before you freeze it. Do that icing after, after you've even refreshed it, just for the best results. But if you forget and you do actually freeze an iced Kringle, it'll be a little bit stickier, but no less delicious. Well, I haven't personally tested shipping Kringle, I know for a fact that it ships really well because bakeries in Wisconsin are famous for shipping hundreds of thousands of Kringles around the country and even some places out of the country. They even stock them in a lot of grocery stores and different places. So Kringle is a very shelf stable, friendly baking project that you can enjoy for days, weeks, even months to come. As always, all the recipes from this episode are linked in the video description below, so head there to snag them or head to food52.com. And if this episode does inspire you to make your own Kringle, please, please, please use hashtag bake it up a notch. Leave us a comment here on YouTube. Let us know because we just love to see what you're baking in your kitchens. I'm getting ready to dive into this Kringle and maybe deliver some Kringle to some of the people around the office here. So until next time, Happy baking. May I interest you in some Kringle?